Someone has already asked in the uh, chat room if that's some shine in the mason jar. They can see me. <laughs> uh, Hi. Let them know what you're drinking. <laughs> Hi. And Summer just said, Hi, Papa Lau. Hi. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Appalachian Traditions, a virtual discussion of traditional Appalachian craft, music, and dance. I'm Darcy Holdorf, the program director at the John C. Campbell Folk School. And as you all have seen, we've got Lyle Wheeler with us here today. And thank you to everyone who's joining us. We've had an overwhelming turnout for these events, and we're so excited to see so much interest in traditional craft. So these webinars are held monthly and a lot has changed since we last gathered. So again, I'll say that I hope you're doing well and you're finding ways to stay creative at home. Um, here at the Folk School, staff are working hard on lots of projects. We are in the final stages of producing our next catalog, which will be released in July. And it will feature the first uh, classes for the first half of 2021. So keep an eye on our social media and sign up for our e-news if you're interested in our upcoming classes. This webinar series is funded by a grant that has brought a lot of new programming to the folk school over the past year, including the masterclass that Lyle would have been teaching this week. We've received continued support from this grant donor and we're developing some new programs around traditional craft, including some community engagement projects and some mentorship opportunities that will bring younger artists together with traditional makers such as Lyle um, to pass down these skills to the next generation. So we'll keep you informed of those and there's some pretty exciting opportunities ahead. So Lyle Wheeler is a longtime folk school instructor and a celebrated chair maker. And I wanna thank Lyle for being um, so patient and um, persevering through some technical obstacles to join us here today. He, um, we're honored to bring him here from his home in Wilkesboro. So if this is your first time joining us for a webinar, just a quick note on how the program works. If you move your mouse, you'll see three icons at the bottom of your screen. Um, the chat is a place for everyone to interact. So go ahead and please introduce yourself. I know some people were asking about Lyle's Moonshine and tell us where you're from and um, where you're joining us from. And Ted Cooley is our music and dance coordinator and he'll be managing that chat box. Hi, Ted. Ted, do you wanna give us a little shout out or? Hi everyone. It's your friendly <laughs> neighborhood, Ted, music and dance coordinator. I'm here to help with uh, the chat room. So I will do my best to answer what I can and throw out the rest to more learned folks. See you soon. Great, right. and he'll be sharing some links in the chat box too. So um, next to the chat icon, you'll see a hand icon. You can click that to raise your hand. So after Lyle's presentation, we'll have a Q&A from the audience. And if you've raised your hand and I call your name, you'll receive a message asking for permission to un unmute your mic. So if you want us to hear your voice, you wanna ask a question or say something to Lyle, you are welcome to raise your hand. 
Um, we also have a Q&A box, which will be managed by our IT administrator, Nick Kelishek. Hi, Nick, you wanna tell us about the Q&A? Sure, you'll be able to ask uh, questions there. And if we have some extra time, we'll, we'll be able to actually um, open you up to, the, to, to speak with Lyle about that question. And we'll try to get as many as we can. Often the, 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 we're, we're short on time. Great, thank you. I see everyone is saying hello in the chat. We've got people from New Zealand and Brazil, Oregon, South Carolina, Minnesota. So that's great. Um, thank you for being here. So I've invited Jack Smoot to give us a brief introduction to the folk school and to help us introduce our panelist. Jack is a folk school student, an instructor, and a previous member of the board of directors. Jack and his wife, Sally, both teach at the folk school and they live in Brasstown and they bring mountains of joy and creativity to our little community. Jack is an advocate of the woodworking program. He plays the mountain dulcimer. He teaches classes on dulcimer building and he also often presents the history of the folk school during our morning song. So welcome Jack, thank you for being here. Thank you, it's good to be here. I'll go ahead and get started. Um, before introducing our speaker, however, um, I would like to say a few things about um, the John T. Campbell Folk School and, and my experience with the school. Uh, I know that there are many of you watching today that may have never been to the folk school. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about it and what the experience is like. Um, I was introduced to the folk school by my wife. She started coming here in 1986 and Sally uh, was wanting to learn how to make split white oak baskets. And um, when we met, um, she gifted me a class at the school and I, I came and took a class in December of 1991. And uh, I uh, came to take a dulcimer building class with Herger Knight. He was the, the resident dulcimer builder here at the time. And um, we uh, struck up quite a friendship. And eventually, um, Herger was the one who recommended me to the folk school as a potential instructor. And I started teaching dulcimer building in the uh, late 90s. I've taken quite a few other woodworking classes here, including a couple of Windsor chair classes. And uh, I've also uh, taken some classes in learning how to play uh, dulcimer and ukulele. I've uh, taken some dance classes, some jewelry classes, uh, stained glass, um, a variety of different kinds of classes here. And, uh, but my true love and my, my real passion is woodworking. And um, I love being in the, the woodworking studio just because of the historical nature of the building. And um, I just have so many memories uh, connected with being there. Um, being in the studio late into the evening and, and working on projects and just sitting around listening to music and enjoying the company of all the wonderful people that you meet. Um, my wife and I love this school so much that we actually moved here um, about 12 years ago from Southeast Missouri. And uh, the folk school is based on the Danish folk school model and uh, it offers a, a wide variety of classes in non-competitive learning environment. And students not only come to take classes in the studios, but you can live on the campus and you can eat in the dining, in the dining hall and have a complete total immersive experience. It's, it's, uh, it's just a magical place all around for that reason. Um, one of the things on my bucket list for classes that I would eventually like to take is a class with um, the gentleman that I'm here to introduce today, Mr. Lyle Wheeler. Um, I have, uh, I was very honored and, and felt privileged to be asked to introduce him. And I'm proud to say that Sally and I do have one of his chairs in our house. Um, from Miller's Creek, I'm gonna read this so I don't miss anything. From Miller's Creek, North Carolina, uh, Lyle has been working wood for most of his life, and originally he was inspired by an article out of the first Foxfire book. I, I learned this uh, watching a small video about, about Lyle, and I didn't realize that, but this was an article about making chairs, and he specializes in ladderback chairs 
and furniture from the late 19th century and is also quite an accomplished blacksmith. And I, and I happen to know that he also builds uh, large spinning wheels, uh, which he has taken great pains to um, engineer so that they, they work incredibly well. Um, he's been teaching at the folk school since 1995, uh, and he's taught 86 classes over that period. He is a longtime member of the uh, Southern Highlands Craft Guild, and uh, he also does educational demonstrations for those folks uh, at, at the uh, uh, Craft Center in, in Asheville. And uh, uh, however, as, as busy as he is building chairs, that's not all that he does. Um, he, uh, is, uh, he, he doesn't spend all of his time in the shop. Sometimes he's spending a little bit of time practicing on the whimmy diddle, and uh, he actually is the world champion in the professional division. So um, if, uh, if anyone wants to post more questions about the whimmy diddle, um, I'm sure uh, Lyle might want to have a few things to say about that. Uh, when he's not practicing on the whimmy diddle or building chairs, he enjoys communicating with friends via postcards, one stamp at a time. And uh, finally, uh, whenever Lyle and I get together, we usually manage to uh, swap a few humorous stories. And uh, sometimes um, we have to kind of go off to the side somewhere <laughs> to, uh, to uh, exchange some of those stories. But um, it's always good to, to, you know, you always need a little humor, a little levity in, in life. And, and Lyle's great at at, uh, at doing that. So without further ado, I want to turn things over to our uh, speaker today, Mr. Lyle Wheeler. Well, thank you, Jack. That was a great introduction. I appreciate it every bit. Um, I'm Lyle Wheeler, humble chair maker. And that's the original oxymoron, humble chair maker. I covered this trade honestly from a long line of good old boys that have always been makers throughout history. Uh, we come from the north side of the Hadrian's Wall in Scotland, uh, came to America, we're makers all through our time. My grandfather finished the eighth grade and went to work in the family wagon business. And by 1930, they were out of business. And he went to work in a factory as a tool maker, a blacksmith tool maker. Another grandfather was, a, was a, a pretty much a jack of all trades. He worked on furniture, built furniture, uh, was a meat carver, a very skilled meat carver in, in, in the stores there. Um, a long line, good old boys. I have some of the tools that passed down from my great grandfather that I use every day. I first got interested in making chairs, from, as Jack said, from the first Foxfire book. There's an article in there about Lyme Reed, a chair maker from near uh, Raven Gap, Georgia. And, and the fascination with the simple tools and the simple construction methods caught my interest. I did some more research. Uh, the second edition of Alan Eaton's book, uh, Handcrafts of the Southern Highlands, had a uh, extensive articles in there about chair making. And I studied those. In the mid 60s, a fellow named Michael Owen Jones left Berkeley, California on a quest to write a book about the handmade object and its maker, why people make things and how they do it. He got as far as Pine Knot, Kentucky, got stopped dead in his tracks um, by Chester Cornett, also known as Charlie Garrels. And the entire book is about chair making in the style that I make them in. Uh, very interesting book. Uh, it has to do a lot with the, the theory behind why somebody wants to pick up a piece of wood and make something out of it. Interesting thing all the way around to be inspired by that book, The Handmade Object and Its Maker. Uh, Mr. Cornett was a very humble chair maker on the side of his shop it said, welcome, we make it or it can't be made. Now that's pretty humble. We make it or it can't be made. I also uh, 
did some research on uh, Roy Underhill's first book, uh, The Woodride Shop. Had a very, very good uh, explanation of chair making in there. So putting all that together, I started making chairs. I studied old chairs and pretty much uh, got some ideas from them. Started making chairs in 1982. Got, I, got, I was screwed at it to begin with, but I was coming along pretty good. Went to my first real craft show, so to speak, up at Appalachian State University, an Appalachian Heritage Show. And I had the benefit of sitting between Ed Presnell and Tom Wolf. Tom is still with us. He's a famous wood carver in the Spruce Pine area now and uh, a tremendous individual. Ed uh, passed away several years ago when he was a famous dulcimer maker um, in the area behind uh, Banner Elk, North Carolina. And between those two were very, very my benefactors in starting my journey in woodworking and chair making. Uh, I was invited to do a North Carolina State Fair as an educational demonstrator in 1986, solely on Ed Presnell's word that I would do a good job. The lady that ran the part of the fair, Mary, Miss Mary Cornwell, needed somebody to fill in part of the part of the thing with two weeks' notice. She called Ed. Ed told her I would do the show. And that's how I got into the state fair and I've been doing it for 35 years. Uh, I juried into the Southern Highlands Guild in 1990. Started doing a July fair there every year. I've done it every year. And in 1994, Tom Wolf brought Ruth Truett by my booth. He introduced me to Ruth. At that time, Ruth was was the programming department at the folk school. She invited me to apply to teach there. I did and have been teaching there since 1995. I've taught a tremendous amount of folks to, to make chairs. Every once in a while you get one, picks it up and makes something out of it. Um, one of those is, is, a, is an instructor there now in uh, Windsor chairs, Brian Comfort. He was still building golf courses, had a straight job back then, came to me, wanted to learn a little chair making. I got him started, um, showed him how to make the chair that I make. He picked it up, went out with it, researched the tools, uh, got into Windsor chairs, and now him and Tommy Boyd teach, a, I think once or at least once or twice a year, teach a good uh, Windsor chair class at the folk school. Um, traditional chair making was throughout the mountains in Appalachia. The people that settled these mountains were, were yeoman farmers. They farmed first and foremost to survive. When they got their farming done, they made things. They were woodworkers, chair makers, coopers, blacksmiths, spinners and weavers, potters, you name it, they made it. They had to do what they could do to survive. But they were farmers first and makers second. The chairs that I make are an Appalachian style, traditional style, uh, found in these, the area here. And the late 1800s is where I'm stuck, 1860 to 1890, I'm stuck in that part of history. Uh, it was the height and the best quality hand tools that were ever produced. Uh, most of those tools were produced in the, in the New England area, um, New York State, upstate New York. Uh, one of my favorite tendon cutters comes from Atlanta, uh, factory in Atlanta. But the folks that made the tools to do this work with made the best tools they were ever made for hand, hand tool work. Uh, L and I, J. White, the Stanley Works was in New Britain, Connecticut. James Swan Company was in Seymour, Connecticut. They were surrounded by other manufacturers. Samuel Colt, the Remingtons, Winchester. Without them, we'd have never made it. There are many styles of chairs out there in the world. And the ones I do are most are basically a post and rung construction. You have posts and rungs to make the frame of the chair. If you visit the Folk Art Center in Asheville, hang, when you go in the front doors, uh, hanging on the wall there are historic chairs from makers of the guild throughout time. The woody chairs are there, some chairs from Shadrach Mace. 
When I became a member of the Guild in 1990, I learned the history of the Guild. And there's a long story told about they made an arduous trip at the invitation of Miss Lucy Morgan to Penland. It was in the late 1920s. Snow on the ground, a hard trip up there. Olive Campbell was at that meeting. They met and created the Southern Highlands Handicraft Guild at that meeting. They go through all this arduous trip to get there and they sat on mountain chairs. That's what it said. Two kinds of chairs were made. Um, folks that were made with draw knives and spoke shades, others were turned on a lathe. Sometimes a treadle lathe, but the first electric motor to hit Mitchell County, North Carolina is hooked to the lathe in Woody's chair shop. Materials I use are um, native Appalachian hardwoods, specifically oak, specifically red oak. It is a ring porous hardwood. The rings of the wood as the tree grows are porous. The sap flows up and down. It rives. The process of riving is to split the wood very carefully with the fro and a mouth. They have red oaks and white oaks. Hickory was used, sometimes ash, sometimes locust. I've made one chair out of locust that commemorates the passing of Ed Presnell. It is near his grave in Banner Elk. It sits outside. And red oaks and white oaks are pretty much work the same. They're my favorite from working, and, and red oak is my favorite for the color and, and um, growth, growth rings and the, and the look of it. White oaks have rounded lobe leaves, make their acorns every year. Red oaks have pointed lobe leaves, make their acorns every other year. In the red oak family, there's red oak, black oak, scarlet oak, pin oak, post oak, chestnut oak, several different oaks. In the, in the red oak part of that, there's northern red oak and southern red oak. That's two subspecies of that same tree. It makes a real good chair because it's strength and beauty for workmanship. When I buy logs, I start with logs and up with chairs. I go to a sawmill, three or four of them I buy from. I look at the logs. I look for five things on the log. I want the center in the center, not off to one side. I want concentric, round, smooth, even growth throughout it. A box between an eighth of an inch a year, average growth. You didn't grow too fast, didn't grow too slow. The center in the center means it grew perpendicular to the face of the earth. It grew plumb, it was not on the hillside, off to one side or the other. The roundness, center in the center, and even growth knocks out about 95% of the logs right there. I'm looking for the veneer quality log, the best one they've got. I'll look at three or 400 logs, I might buy one of them. The next thing I look at is the length of the log. I look at two things there. A bump on a log is a knot, and I don't want a knot, so I want clear and straight, no bumps. The last thing I look for is twist. If the bark twists, the wood is gonna twist also. In over 12 feet, you can get by with about maybe five degrees of twist in 12 feet. More than that, and it's too much to deal with. So I've looked at all these logs. I picked out the prettiest one I could find. And the chair maker's action to that, and we're using work pretty wood, this life of two shirt to dance with jerks and ugly women. We take the prettiest log we can, we do the best work we can do with it. I've got a lot of numbers floating around in my head for the lengths that I need to cut this log up to to get the chairs I'm going to make. Uh, 44 is a good number, 60 is a number, 39 is a number. The logs are uh, 12 foot 6 long, so that's 150 inches. So I cut the log up with the power saw to the sizes I need for the chairs that I'm going to make from it and I quarter it at the mill. I take mallet and wedges and 
sledgehammer and bust it up into quarters at the mill. That makes it so I can easily handle it and get it to my shop. Once I decide to make a chair out of that quarter of a log, I go through a process called riving. This is a quarter of that log, the length of the longest piece in the chair. I use a fro and a mallet. And here's the sap part, and here's the center part. We don't use that, and we don't use that. And I will take a fro and drive it on that line there. This is a fro. It is a long, tapered wedge with a hand. Very dull, it's not sharp. You heard the old saying, dull as a fro? This is a fro, it's dull. You want to split the wood, not cut into it. It's like making firewood, but very precisely making firewood. So to lay that fro on that first you know, equal mass on both sides, and split that quarter in two and get an eighth. Take and split it across there, and then here, and get areas for posts. I might split that over here, and then here, cut this billet to length, split that into, that into, that into, and get the parts for my backs the slats through the backs of the chair. I might get another post over here, possibly one there. What doesn't make posts makes rungs. So you go from the longest, strongest piece first, down to the smallest piece. This is theoretical chair making. Everything thing goes to plan with no big mistakes you can get one chair from a quarter of a log the length of the longest piece control splitting and there's no waste to get to these parts no waste whatsoever if you take and saw this out you're going to get a quarter inch of dust each time you make a cut you'll never get that dust back by splitting it out there is zero waste whatsoever to get to these pieces piece for a rung would come out of the log right there. The posts come out where they do. I use draw knives and spoke shaves to shape the parts from my chairs. This is a draw knife. This particular one was made by the James Swan Company, Seymour, Connecticut. It's got the little swan up here. And, and embossed right in the top of it says James Swan, best tool steel. And they were. The Swan Company, um, perfected the process of crucible steel, making alloy steel in the crucible, perfected the process, and we're famous for it. If you can find a tool that says swan on it, you should buy it. This would be a good one, good one to have. This is a James Swan draw knife, and I use it in conjunction with a shaving horse, which is nothing more than a treadle foot clamp that you sit upon, treadle the clamp with your foot, it clamps down on the wood and use a draw knife to shape the parts. I keep this fairly sharp, so I'll put the guard back on it here. The second tool we use is a spoke shave. This one here is a Stanley model uh, 151 spoke shave has a curved sole in it. 
and you use the draw knife to make a square, then octagonal, and then you take the octagonal corners off with the rounding draw knife or smoke shape to make the pieces round. Blacksmiths out there remember the part about square to octagonal to round. It's the same thing they do in drawing out a piece of stock to get from square to round. You have to go through octagonal first. Okay. So I work all the wood green, then I dry it, then I assemble the chair. I'm always working with the rings and rays when I arrive. I want to arrive either on the rings or on the rays to get the parts out of the chair. When I put it back together, I'm going to go 45 degrees to those and put it back together with the strength of the wood. So we rely on the weakness of it to take it out of the tree and the strength of it to put the chair back together. When I teach, the first thing I teach is sharpening. I teach that on Sunday night. We go through a process of sharpening our tools so all the students that learn how to do this can work very well. A sharp tool cuts the wood and does a real good job with it. A dull tool makes your life miserable. So after we work through the thing and the student is having trouble, we've already covered sharpening, it must be operator error at that point. I dry the rungs as dry as I can get them. As wood dries, it shrinks. It won't get any smaller. It keeps shrinking and shrinking until it's dry. It won't get any smaller. So I dry the rungs and I dry the backs, as dry as I can get them, down to around 7 to 10% moisture content, which is furniture grade dry. The posts are still a little bit wet. Air dry down to around 25 to 30% or so. So when I put the chair together, I go through what's called a comedy of errors. The comedy of errors comes in when you are uh, putting the chair together, you've got 11 to 13 rungs. That's 22 to 26 ends on each, on each of those rungs. I cut them to length, go through a process of tenoning, Got the tenons on there. And eyeball this thing and work as close as I can work to it. Sometimes minor errors cancel themselves out. Sometimes they multiply. And you don't know till you get the chair together whether it's going to be a laugh or not. Pieces I make for the rungs. This is a billet for the rung I showed before. There's the rung that goes comes out of it. There. That's better. So this piece here will come out of there with two tools, basically a draw knife and a spoke shape. It's very easy and simple and quick to make this piece. If you tried to make it in a factory, it would take five machines and a long time. With a draw knife and a spoke shape, you can make this piece in 10 or 15 minutes. It's called the seat rung. It's got a particular shape to it. And it's, it sits in the chair like that, flat. And it two things, it helps carry the weight of the person sitting in it. It also lets the material in the bottom go off easier. So we got that. So, cut the rungs to length, possible length. And now I use a brace and a bit to put it together. This is a brace. The brace, all the brace does is provides rotary motion to a bit stock that goes in the end. One brace, many bits. If it looks like that on the end, it goes in there. This is an auger bit used to bore the holes for the assembly process. Once I get the rungs cut the length, I have another brace, what's called a dowel pointer. This cone-shaped cut, all it does is make the cone shape the, the bevel on the end of the rung, the bevel on the end of the uh, bottom end of the uh, legs, sometimes on the top. But all this does is cut that bevel. This tool has been around for many, many years, 150 years.
This tool here, another brace, this tool here is called a tenon cutter or a hollow auger. And what it does is it cuts the tendon on the end of that rung. This one here is a Stearns, H. Stearns and Company out of Syracuse, New York. Made this thing probably 150 years ago. It's got the same diameter, plus or minus 5 thousandths of an inch, I'd say for 150 years. A very useful tool. In researching old tools, there are 12 patent depositories throughout the country. The closest one here is at the D.H. Hill Library down at NC State University. And on file there are the patents that have ever patent have ever been granted is on file there. You can go there, you can pull the drawings, you can look at them, you can get copies of the drawings. So this is called a hollow auger or a tendon cutter. It has its own classification in the patent system. Now, it does one thing. It, it cuts a diameter. Some of them are different ones or have adjustments here um, to make different diameters. They slide with plates. They have a depth stop in them. Um, I'll research at one time. There were 128 different patentable ideas to accomplish the same task. These were used in chair making, they were used in wagon making, in other kinds of wood tools, in furniture making to make dowels, all kinds of things. But there were 128 different and patentable ideas to accomplish the same thing at the height of these tools in the 1820s to 1890. Quite a thing, that many patents for one item. Once I get the chair together, I, I, do, I do, all, do all the mortising, get the backs, get the, get the um, chair put together. It has to sit for about a week or so and come together. It's a drive fit. I'm driving together, boom, boom, boom. The tenon I cut is about 10 thousandths of an inch larger than the hole I bore. It's an interference fit. I drive it together. The post shrinks on the rung and will not let it go. After it's together, leveled out, I uh, weave a seat in it. And the seat materials traditionally were wide oak splints and hickory bark. I use uh, both of those materials. I also use rattan reed, a flat reed. It comes from the Calamus family of trailing vines in the floor of the jungles of Southeast Asia, Malaysia, and the Philippines. Uh, a lot of folks know that is uh, cane work or cane furniture, but the, it is a uh, commercially available material that looks like white oak. Does very well. So I take and I weave the bottom in a traditional pattern. I'm going to show the frame of a, of a footstool here first. This is what the frame looks like before the bottom's put on. You'll notice out here they have two different heights for the height of the rungs. It's all put together without the glue, screws, or nails, driven together. I need to backtrack a little bit here. Forgot this important part. This right here is the pattern stick. It's hard to see. All the information to make, to make a chair for this particular pattern, it's a one slat side chair, is the chair I teach in my class. All the information for that chair is on this stick. It's like a story stick. All the dimensions come off the floor, the heights of all the rungs, the length of the pieces, where the, where the mortise goes for the top, for the back. All the parts for that chair are on this stick. How to put it together in a reasonable reproduction of each piece. And I have made 164 chairs of this of this pattern. So we soak the material in water, and it's a woven bottom. 
For you weavers out there, it's warp and weft. You put the warp on and then weave the pattern through it. This particular pattern is a three over three twill pattern. So you warp, weave the bottom in, let it dry, clean it up. And then I put a three part finish on there. Well, basically uh, turpentine, linseed oil, and a little bit of hard varnish. It's traditional finish. It's oil based. It's very forgiving. It can be rejuvenated at any time with more oil. I average about 40 chairs a year, half for a long time. Closing in on 2,000 chairs. Never thought it'd be that many. It's an amazing thing to make chairs this way. It's a subtraction process. You're always taking something away until you're done. My chairs are sold by commission only, and sometimes at high-end craft shows. Um, I've been doing the North Carolina State Fair as an educational demonstrator for 35 years. I've been doing this, the uh, July edition of the Craft Fair of the Southern Highlands for 30 years. And folks can buy there and, and, and see my work and, and purchase chairs or order them. Um, you can also visit my website, LyleWheelerChairMaker.com. Now, back to the beginning when I forgot to mention the part about the folk school. <laughs> um, when the folk school got started, there were folks that pledged um, their time and their toil and their materials and their wealth to start the folk school. And Darcy has a picture of a gentleman that was a chairmaker in the folk school area, in the Brasstown area. And there he is delivering his pledge to the school, the chairs. It's quite an accomplishment. There are probably 30 chairs hanging off this, this vehicle here, all over it. And he's rather proud of himself for doing that. There's another picture Darcy has of folks at the Carvers, I believe, at the folks school, sitting on some of those chairs. The same ones are right there. And then Nick has uh, one of the chairs from the, from the that are still in the Keith house, there's one of them right there. The very ones that were made for the school. Quite the piece. It's been rebottomed once or twice. The frame will last forever, the bottom 20, 25 years. But that's one right there. So the pieces we're making today can be seen for a long time and used for a long time. This chair makes thirsty work. <laughs> Thanks, Lyle. Just, we have some questions and you're getting a lot of comments on here. Beautiful tools, how economical the way you use your, your resources. And then someone, Norman says, I'm caning a chair seat as I watch. So that's great. Um, were you ready for questions or? I'm ready. Um, half of it, the, the fun is, is hunting the tools. Estate sales, flea markets, uh, junk stores, wherever you can find them. Great. Uh, Ted or Nick, do you want to start with some questions from our attendees? Sure. Vincent Hunter wanted to know why not use the heart and sapwood? Uh, the sapwood has not been matured to late wood yet. It is very weak. The center part is where the tree is young and growing like this. Until it straightens up, you don't have very good wood. It has a lot of little pin knots in it. And so the, the heart and the, and the sapwood we don't use. But from the way we work it, we get about 85% yield out of a log, which is a good yield for, for, for usage of wood. Rusty wants to know uh, if you could tell us a little bit about Atlanta made tenon cutters. The one from Atlanta come from the James Wood Company, the, I mean the AA Woods Company out of Atlanta. Um, it was totally adjustable from a quarter inch to an inch and a quarter in diameter and from a half inch to three inches long. It would cut any tenon inside those dimensions. At two plates, it slid back and forth this way. You dial it, one plate moved twice as fast as the other and kept the center in the center. A very useful tool. 
I have two of those. One I use to cut various different size tenons for the things I make. And the other one is just in spare because they're not made anymore at all. It was the AA Woods Company out of Atlanta, probably uh, last made about 1930 or so. Les Sue wants to know about how many chairs do you create a year on average? I make about 40 chairs a year. I've got plenty of other work, uh, my furniture work, my spinning wheels, my blacksmithing, and my toy making. Now, all that stuff keeps me pretty busy, but I have about 40 chairs a year. Carol is curious to know how many spinning wheels you've made and what species of wood to use for those. I have made 61 spinning wheels. Um, I use native Appalachian hardwoods based on the, the, um, the use of the wood for the best part of the job. I always use oak in the band because of its bending qualities to bend, bend the rim. It's a two piece rim bent. I always use walnut in the attention adjuster screw because it threads good. Usually maple in the spindle head um, for dimensional stability. The rest of it can be pretty much anything. Any, but native Appalachian hard was oak, cherry, walnut, maple, sometimes ash. Rusty would like to know what parts of your chair are steam bent. Um, sometimes I don't bend a lot in my chairs. Um, when I bend the backs, which I brought the back rack here, I bend the backs, but they're bent green. Sometimes when I, bend, I steam bend, I steam bend the back posts. It's a saturation steam. It's not, it's, it's not extremely hot. Um, I hold about 190 degrees in the steam box for about an hour. You want wet steam, not dry steam. Skip would like to know how far you travel for your logs. Not very far. <laughs> Here where I live, I'm, we're surrounded with some pretty good sawmills, uh, ones that are still operating. Uh, the last log I got was about six miles away. Uh, mill I've been dealing with for a long time. I called them, said I was on the way for a log. They set three or four out. They already know what I'm looking for. They set three or four out, and I got to pick one of those and got to make it into chairs. Margie would like to know the difference between the Appalachian style chair and the shaker chair. Um, the shaker chairs were made in New England. They were definite um, to patterns that were handed down from one to the next. They had um, basically numbers for the size from one up to seven. Um, they were specific sizes without any extraneous orna ornamentation whatsoever. They would sometimes cut a finial at the top, but there was no extraneous design work in any of those chairs. Appalachian chairs are made mostly with drawn knives and spoke shape. The shaker chairs were turned on a lathe. Uh, the Appalachian chairs, drawn knife and spoke shape, a little different construction, sometimes bending the back post. The shakers bent some of their back posts. Um, they also tapered some of the back posts on theirs. Not a whole lot of difference except in the folks that made them in the, the stricture of being uh, in the shaker tradition. Lyle, can you tell us the best uh, time for harvesting wood? Um, doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Uh, the log is going to be wet and green no matter when. Um, however, making, making the hickory bark is, is done between the middle of May and the middle of June. We're almost out of bark rossing season right now. When you see a lot of saw, logs going to the sawmill and the bark's just falling off and that's when you make bark. The tree has got its leaves out. The bark is released to add that next layer of growth and that's when you make the bark. But logs in, um, in the sawmills, it's pretty much the same year round. Okay, I've, I've got a few questions from the Q&A section. Um, do, uh, if a student takes a class in chair making from you at the folk school, what stage in the process do they start? At the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> now, I show up with uh, pre rod billets, um, stuff that looks like this. It 
It says my battery's running low. I can't believe that because. Looks like we've got we've got a lot of comments here about people who have your spinning wheels, Lyle. Just to let you know, Mary Rutherford and a few others say they have your spinning wheels, and and I gotta plug this thing in. Hang on. Okay, that's fine. Um, <laughs> 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 Nick, do you want? <laughs> Maybe we should um, uh, <laughs> turn that camera off just for a moment. Um, <laughs> Pardon my back. Here, come, here it comes. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I should, have, should have expected that from you, Lyle. <laughs> A question got, about yeah. Um, do people use lathe work in the posts as well? Lathe work on the posts? Yeah. Uh, in my chair class, no. It's all drawn up in spoke shade work. Um, just back to that previous question, Lyle, I think for, for some people who maybe aren't familiar with the folk school, um, you do make a, a chair in a week. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, it's quite a feat. It is. It's uh, probably uh, the most physically demanding class on campus that week. Uh, we do have to work late a couple of nights. But it's basically it's a process of starting with the billets that are already arrived and the students shape them down. We have a uh, kiln box, a dry kiln box on the front porch of the wood studio. So we get the rungs done, we put them in there, we make our backs, put them in there, and they start drying. Then we make the posts. And we get all the parts made by usually Wednesday afternoon, Wednesday evening, and then devote Thursday and, and Friday to assembly. Great. Um, Lyle, do you do you have an apprentice? And what are you doing to teach other than teaching at the folk school? Do you um, how are you passing that tradition down? I have had several folks come to me over the years to learn chair making. And it's a it's a, a long drawn out process. Uh, you have to you have to kind of um, do a little bit of research in it for one thing and, and make your shaving horse. Because without the shaving horse and a little bit of research, you, you have nothing to work with. I have plenty of tools, and I loan the tools out to my students that come here. And we'll go, we make a footstool first. And then the, in the class I teach, we, we may collectively make a couple footstools. So you start, you learn the process of, of shaping the parts very quickly, and then go on to chair making. So I'll, we'll make some parts, I'll send them home with material. They come back with the parts made, we go further. Once they get all their parts made, then we get into assembly. Uh, Ted and Nick, I see some more questions on there. Do you have yes. anything? Go Lyle, ahead. Uh, several people are curious about your finish and what they can do to uh, treat some wood that's dried out that they might have uh, some furniture, uh, spinning wheels, so on and so forth. Well, linseed oil and turpentine. The linseed oil is called boiled linseed oil. You have to get the bowl kind, the raw will never dry. Uh, the turpentine is, um, it must say on the side of the container, pure gum spirits of turpentine or steam distilled spirits of turpentine. That's the true, that's the true material. There are imposters out there, turpentine, some other things that are imposters. But those two mixed together equal parts with a little bit of hard varnish, a spar varnish uh, to give them a more durable finish. Um, and just mix them up 50. 50 and, and, and applied with a, with a light brow. A real light coat is more important than a heavy coat, um, but just a light coat on there. Let it sit about an hour, wipe off the excess. In another year, you might have to do the same thing. If folks have got furniture that's dried out, um, test the oil finish on there, test the part you can't see. If it's compatible, you'll know. It'll go, it'll go right in, soak into the material. A lot of furniture is made with a um, urethane different plastic finishes and never touch the wood again and my finish is not compatible with that. Uh, Lau, can you tell us about um, what level of student uh, is is your class okay for beginners or what kind of experience do they have to have? I prefer beginners there's fewer bad habits to have to correct. All right. 
Wow, can you talk a little bit about the type of seating you put into your chairs and stools? Um, I use rattan reed mostly. Uh, special order, I do uh, hickory bark, white oak splints, and sometimes what's called shaker tape, which is a woven cotton material. Uh, back when the shakers made furniture and the men made the frames, the women wove the tape and then wove it into the seats, considered equal labor. They could work on the same piece but still stay separate. Wow, this is Jack. Um, we can't let you get away without saying a few words about the Wimmy Diddle. You don't happen to have one there with you, do you? Not right handy. I wish I did. I wish I did. The Wimmy Diddle is a traditional fountain folk toy made out of rhododendron, a series of notches. I don't have one handy. Wish I did. Gosh, I'm gonna, uh, anyhow. You rub the two sticks together, make the propeller on, it's a propeller on the end of the stick, make it turn. I don't have one. <laughs> Do you reach a takeoff speed with it? Sir? Do you reach takeoff speed? <laughs> oh, no, you don't reach takeoff speed. The uh, championships are, de are determined by how many times you can change direction. A G is to the right, haw to the left, just like a, you, you're driving mules, G haw, win me diddle. And you can move the propeller, the stick back and forth to change directions. And the competition in the professional division is very serious. We've been known to change directions upwards of 30 to 40 times in 12 seconds. Wow. Wow, well, you've got a question from Rusty. He says, do you harvest your own hickory bark and do you teach harvesting of hickory bark? And I think Rusty might be your next student. I do harvest some of my own. I also purchase some from folks that uh, specialize in making bark over in uh, northern, uh, northern middle Tennessee, where there's a, an abundance of hickory trees over there. <clears throat> The rossing is a process where you cut the tree down. You want one that's about six or eight inches in diameter. You cut the tree down, cut it 12 to 15 foot length, take your drawing knife and peel the outer bark off, and then taking you down to the inner bark, what's called the cambium layer, the inner bark, you run your knife down through it and pull the strips off the tree. If it is thick enough, you can splint that and get two pieces. Lyle, your friend Steve says that he knows you do some blacksmithing and do you integrate that into your chair making? Not really. No, I don't combine the two for that. Elsie would like to know, do some woods shrink more than other woods and do you ever use walnut? Uh, when I use walnut chair or maple, I'm making a dry board chair where I'm sawing it out of dry boards and I do put them together with glue. Um, the rate of shrinkage has to do with the grain structure of the wood. The more open woods, the hickories, oaks, uh, woods like that shrink a little more than the denser uh, fruit woods, cherry, maple, and walnut. Okay, well, we've just got a few more minutes. Uh, Jack, did you have any questions for Lyle before he goes? No, I think he's covered a lot of ground here today. I'm, I, I'm uh, even more interested in taking one of his classes now after hearing him speak about it. I, I've sat in his chairs and, and as I said earlier, we own one. And uh, I did see where someone in the chat had asked if you um, had made the rocker that you're sitting in, Wow, that was one of your award-winning rockers, wasn't it? Uh, this is uh, a copy of the one that I won the um, uh, Made in North Carolina um, competition last year from our state magazine. Um, sub submitted my chair, and I had one very similar to this made out of the same materials. Uh, walnut posts, oak arms, rungs, and runners, and spalded maple in the backs and a hickory bark bottom. Well, I think that's just a gorgeous combination of woods in that chair. And, and that's one of the things that I like about your furniture is, is the, you know, some of the, some of the uh, combinations that you've come up with. 
Yeah, you, you you pick. I've always buying for lumber. I've always got good good wood to work, and I see I see a piece that goes good with something else. I'll save until it's time to use those in a piece. And and again, it's just the, it's a, it's the native Appalachian hardwoods. And not doing. I don't stain for color. I let the wood speak for itself. Well, I'm the same way with my my instruments. I you know I I made up my mind a long time ago to stick with uh, native uh, Appalachian hardwoods for the dulcimers. And then when I started building a few ukuleles, I, I branched out with some more exotics. But I love seeing those boards sitting around and, and just thinking about the potential in them and, and uh, looking forward to, to trying them out. Yeah, we're surrounded here with the best quality and quantity of, of hardwoods in the world. Absolutely. With our, our harvesting practices. So, so Lyle, just for fun, we do have um, Robert and Olivia Anderson, who are also very involved in the folk school and in woodworking. They raised their hand, so I, I, I wonder if, if you're there. I've allowed you to talk. Robert, are you there? The backs in this chair come from Robert Sawmill. Are you there? I, I, I'm here. Can you Did you want to ask a question or say hello? I just wanted to say hello to Lyle and thank him for that this presentation. We've watched and enjoyed the whole thing. And I'm going to sign up for his class too. Yeah, I got the, I got the lumber in the backs of this chair came from Robert Sawmill. In return, for a little, in return for a little bit of that clear stuff you were drinking earlier, as I recall. <laughs> <laughs> all, all right. I'll, well, on that note, it is five o'clock. <laughs> so Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and put your hand down there, Robert. All right. So thank you so much, Lyle. That was enlightening. We've got a lot of people really interested in your classes. We did link to Lyle's upcoming classes. He teaches about a half a dozen times a year in two programs, and he's just an excellent instructor and a lot of fun. So um, take a look at our website and our, and our new catalog in July. Um, and um, I encourage you to visit his website and take a look at the video from Our State Magazine. It's a um, great video and we will share a recording of this presentation in a follow-up email so that you can re-watch it and you can share it. And if you've enjoyed this webinar and would like to donate to the Folk School so that we can continue to bring you craft, music, and dance programming, we will share a link to a tip jar. Um, Ted, can you share that link to the Fund a Need? So um, you can go ahead and, and donate to us if you'd like. Um, our next webinar will be on July 13th and we will feature Catherine Ellis who will be talking about natural dyeing. Catherine is the originator of the woven shibori process. She's the author of several books. She was a, um, an instructor in fiber at Haywood Community College for over 30 years. And she's prepared an incredible presentation with photographs of her dye garden and photos of our new folk school dye garden. So um, we can share some links to Catherine's website and to register for the next webinar if you'd like to join us. Um, so we'll share that in the chat box right now, Ted, if you could get that register, the link to register. Um, so thank you very much. We appreciate you being here. We miss you at the folk school, but we hope that you're well and we look forward to seeing you again um, on campus. So thank you. And thank you, Lyle. And thank you, Jack. Appreciate the opportunity. You're welcome. I enjoyed it. All righty. So there's that link there. Ted shared that if you'd like to join us again. And have a wonderful day.